typically it's not a topic of conversation until something happens and then everybody gets very squirmy and like oh shoot how do we handle this what do we do you are listening to the alzheimer's podcast with mike good of togetherness your number one resource for practical tips and insights empowering you and your family to live well with alzheimer's Hello and welcome to episode 35 of the Alzheimer's Podcast. I'm Mike Good of Togetherness. Thank you for listening to this podcast where my goal is always to empower you to maintain a positive experience, reduce and eliminate the need for medications, and make your time together with those you care for the best it can be. There are several topics in dementia care that most of us don't want to think about, let alone discuss until something happens. But ignoring these topics and being unprepared doesn't help anyone and typically results in negative outcomes. So today, Christy Turner and I, mostly Christy on this topic, will be discussing sexual relationships in long-term care settings when an individual has dementia. I'm pleased to say that Christy Turner, the Dementia Sherpa, is a regular guest here on the Alzheimer's Podcast. She provides a level of knowledge, empathy, and compassion that I believe you will find very helpful. She is a certified dementia practitioner, certified dementia care unit manager, and cognitive stimulation instructor. She has run award-winning memory care communities in assisted living and skilled nursing levels of care. Using her 16 years of experience in working with over 1,100 people living with dementia and their families, she's developed a system that helps families move from crisis management to confidence. Hello, Christy. It's great to have you back for another episode of Navigating Rough Terrain with the Dementia Sherpa. I'm delighted to be back. Thanks so much for having me. You're very welcome. So, Christy, when you ran memory care communities, I assume, since you're going to talk about about it, this issue of determining sexual consent came up for you and your staff? It did, and people have very different directions, and we probably have listeners right now that are kind of squirming just on the fact of the topic. I, I am. (laughs) (laughs) it is uh, one of those things that I think is not the first thing we think of when we're thinking of dementia but when we think about adults are sexual beings doesn't solely define our identity but it is definitely a part of it and so Uh, When you look at all of the changes that happen for a person who's living with dementia across every area, uh, this is another area. Yeah, it's definitely an area that I hadn't really considered. And I mean, sure, I saw headlines and articles kind of touching on the topic, but I never really gave it much thought. And, And I'm definitely surprised it's a topic of conversation. I think this is one of the reasons that it's great that we're doing the podcast on this topic today is because typically it's not a topic of conversation until something happens and then everybody gets very squirmy and like, oh shoot, how do we handle this? What do we do? And in any situation, whether it's of a sexual nature or anything else, when you don't see something coming, it does leave you kind of wondering, what am I supposed to do? And you can get a panicky feeling, and I hate that panicky feeling, so I assume everybody else does too. Exactly. So I always like to see kind of what's coming around the corner. That doesn't mean that everybody who's living with dementia will um, encounter any of these particular issues, but it does happen uh, quite a bit for people living in long-term care. Again, not everybody, but I think it's better to be aware of it and know that it's a possibility than be surprised. And is this typically like in a memory care setting between two residents? 
Oh yes, yes. So uh, if it's uh, if we're talking about sexual contact between a staff member and a resident, that is never anything other than abuse. Right. That is absolutely one hundred percent. There's no wiggle room there. And the reason I say that is because a staff member is, by virtue of being a staff member, um, in violation of a job description, ethical standards, um, in a position of power. So no. That's right. just never okay. There's no argument that anybody could make for me that would lead me to believe it's okay. It's just not. So yes, we are talking about resident to resident contact. Okay. When I was a volunteer, and as I've mentioned before, I've never had a loved one with Alzheimer's that I'm aware of, and I've never cared for one, obviously. But when I was volunteering, you know, I never thought about this during that, of course, but I'm, I'm thinking back of all the people I met and I'm wondering, how would I ever have been able to determine that person's capacity for consent? You know, so how, how as a, you know, a staff member, or, you know, are you able to do that? So it, it's a process and we call it the five C's of sex and long-term care. So number one is capacity, looking at that. Number two is consent. Number three is no interfering children, spouse or staff. So the the C in children is where that third C comes from. Okay. Four is coupling and five is care planned or service planned. And so just to break that down a little bit without putting people to sleep, um, <laughs> the first C being capacity is we're looking at, does the person have the capacity to say no to uninvited sexual contact. So are they at a point in the disease process where if somebody came up to them and started touching them, be it sexually or not sexually, would they be able to say, no, I don't want that or, you know, move away from that or indicate in any way that, you know, they're not into it. So that's an important thing. The second thing is, do they have the capacity to say yes? So that could be verbally, that could be through actions. Uh, again, you know, are they sort of leaning into it, so to speak? Okay. And a third piece is, do, do these two people seem to have a relationship, right? Or is it just one person who is exhibiting sexual behavior toward multiple people? Okay, okay. So that's kind of what we're looking at there. And capacity essentially is we, we want to make sure that the person has sufficient memory capacity, right, right, to evaluate and to make a choice. That doesn't mean that they have to, you know, have high verbal skills necessarily, but just is this something that they want to do? Does it seem that they have the judgment, you know, the capacity to make that judgment that they want to engage in this behavior and that they understand the consequences of it? And are they, you know, being able to freely decide? Okay. We don't want anybody feeling coerced, obviously. Right. And again, I'll, I'll just say this again, because I imagine there are listeners whose heads are spinning, Memory care is not a place of unbridled, unbound <laughs> sexual activity. That's not what happens, okay? But there are people who do have sexual relationships. And typically in a memory care, that's not necessarily intercourse, but it may be sexual touching okay. um, and something that you know, I guess the best way to describe it is, would you be comfortable if this was happening in your living room in front of guests? If it's a no, then that would be, you know, something that residents would be directed to go to, you know, one of their respective apartments to engage in that type of activity. So typically it's touching above the waist, although sometimes it goes below the waist also. Okay. So I, I think one the first key that you mentioned there was the fact of are they kind of in a relationship, you know, and then in one of our previous episode where we talked about uh, my loved one has a sweetheart in memory care, we talked about hand holding and, and kind of having that boyfriend, girlfriend relationship. And I didn't think of it at the time of going beyond that level of um, intimacy so mm -hmm. I think the key for staff is here to understand that that relationship, as you're saying. 
Right. And so usually it doesn't go beyond hand holding, maybe hugging, but sometimes it does. Okay. And the staff reaction, the children reaction, this is where it comes to, you know, are people able to engage in the activity that they are showing or verbalizing that they want to without interference from other people and the reason that that and again I'm just imagining there are some listeners whose heads are spinning right now going what do you mean without interference that you know it shouldn't be happening but again think of people let's say somebody who is you know 74 years old and is living in memory care now but has been active and and vibrant and you know in is in good physical shape and finds a so-called sweetheart right and it's a a consensual thing it happens Mm -hmm. it does happen it's harder for in my experience it is harder for adult children to see this happen and it's harder for staff to see this happen than it typically is for a spouse. Okay. And when I'm saying see it happen, I don't mean voyeuristically. I mean just watching a relationship develop. What I'm wondering is usually when you're going to have some sexual contact or whatever, there's some planning involved and you, you would sneak away to a room and, you know, and hide from people. And is that is that what happens or do you find that it is happening more out in the the foyer or the open public space? I would say (laughs) just by the nature of it, because of being in a living in a community with a lot of staff around and co-residents and family members in and out. Um, Sneaking is, as a general rule, pretty difficult to pull off. (laughs) But so communities are required to provide privacy for residents. So if this is a relationship that they're engaged in and they want that privacy, then they're allowed to have it. I'm thinking of probably the first experience I had along these lines was, gosh, probably close to 15 years ago. And the in this case, it was a so-called sneak. <laughs> and so okay two residents were in bed together and they were uh, one was partially clothed and the other was fully clothed and they were touching one another and obviously having a good time uh, you know nobody nobody was complaining but the staff member walked into the room so number one staff members are never supposed to walk into a room they are supposed to knock, wait for an answer, and then walk into the room. So that didn't happen. So that that in and of itself was a violation of resident rights. The second thing that happened is the staff member screamed. Oh, no. <laughs> because, yeah, she was so shocked. She didn't expect to see that. And then the third thing that happened was the staff member scolded the residents mm. And because it was against her religious beliefs that unmarried people should have any type of uh, intimate contact. Oops. Right. So (laughs) there are just like multiple issues there in that one story to unpack. But like I said, so it was a violation of rights to enter without knocking and, and getting permission to enter. The second thing was screaming is always inappropriate. (laughs) And the third thing is whatever our own beliefs or values, when we work in a community, in fact, when we're working with seniors in any capacity, be they cognitively impaired or not, our job is always to support them in their own self-determination. So we want them to be as independent as possible. And of course, safety is always a thing. And this comes back to the five C's of do people have capacity, consent, you know, all of that stuff. So this kind of happened backwards. So then we, you know, kind of unspooled the whole thing, dealt with the immediate situation, and then started looking at all of that. And and in this case, it was just uh, that perfect storm of Nobody seemed to have noticed that romance blooming until we started talking to other people and, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, they always sit together. Oh, yeah. And then it was like, okay, in hindsight, maybe we should have seen that coming. And in this case, 
they did gravitate toward one another. They were easily able to distinguish one another from other residents. And they definitely wanted to have the contact that they were wanting. One of the people had an adult child who, you know, uh, got a little twitchy about the whole thing, uh, but was willing to, you know, meet with us on the on the executive team, talk it through, get some further education about what are normal needs for older adults and how that's affected or not by dementia. And so we wrote a care plan just saying, you know, we'd been through this process, determined capacity and consent, uh, had met with the family multiple times. Uh, the two people involved were choosing to, to be a couple. And here's the care plan. And here was our plan for providing them privacy when that was what they wanted. And, you know, I think that the, the um, that actual in the bed situation only happened a couple more times, but essentially it was something like, you know, there was an afternoon uh, movie matinee. They sat next to each other and hold hands. They would sit at the same table at dinner across from each other so they could look into each other's eyes. Um, it was very sweet mm -hmm. and it just fulfilling that need that we all have for human contact. And I think this is kind of one of those parts where the issue can become convoluted because we may mistakenly think that any contact, any, you know, person to person contact is sexual in nature, when in fact, it may just be friendly touch that we're talking about. You touched on a little there was the family and are you obligated as the staff or the community to notify the family and let them know of that? Or is that just a best yes. practices? Yes, so that is that is something that should happen, and and again, not just that type of situation, but if somebody's given the wrong medication, or if somebody, you know, I mean, there are just all types of situations where the family should be contacted. My personal belief was always and remains always that the family should have a very high number of touches, meaning phone calls. They should never be surprised. Uh, when they sit down at a service plan meeting or a care plan meeting, they should never be surprised about anything that comes out of the staff's mouth. And, I, you know, and, and that was what I always told families. Stop me, call me, email me, text me, what, whatever, anytime. I should never surprise you. And when we sit down to these meetings, I don't ever want you surprising me. So if you have a concern, just let me know. Because this is essentially... All a family is saying when they choose to help their uh, person move into a memory care or assisted living or whatever setting it is, is for whatever reason, this person's needs can't be met in their current home. And so we're coming to you as professionals for assistance with that. That doesn't mean that they're saying, we don't want to be involved in this person's life anymore. Or we're not family anymore or anything like that. So yeah, the, the staff does need to be very proactive in these types of situations. And so, like you've talked about in our other episode and a little here, the adult children tend to be the ones that are taken back by it more than the spouses. And so how do you respond and how, I mean, to those family objections and concerns? And do they, you know, I, I can picture them go running to their, their loved one and trying to scold them almost or you know <laughs> correct it themselves or correct it's not the word but yeah i i understand what you're saying i am thinking of another situation where actually this uh very very sweet man he had kind of found a sweetheart and they would uh sit together and hold hands during group programs and uh the wife actually moved him out of the community because she didn't want that happening it was very sad, mm -hmm. um, and that's the only situation that I've ever uh, been involved in where a spouse um, had that response. Typically, spouses are just huge-hearted. For kids, I think it's tougher just going back to when we're little kids, right? And you kind of figure out the birds and the bees, and then you count the number of siblings you have and figure that's how many times your parents engaged in any sort of activity, and you know, that's it. Other than that, you don't even want to think about it. Right. And I think. 
that that's just something that kind of stays with us our entire lives, even if we're, you know, 60 years old and, and talking about what's going on with our 85-year-old parent. So in that way, we kind of just never lose that response that we have as little kids. I think education is a really important piece of this. So when we can, as professionals, talk to a family about, you know, what's normal for aging adults and what's normal in uh, the dementia process. And so they have more information. I think one of the things in any aspect of dementia that freaks out family members is they don't know what to expect. They'll think that they have their arms wrapped around whatever the current situation is, and they may well. And then, you know, it's dementia, so it changes. Things evolve over time. And so I think once we kind of take the the stigma away from it, you know, once people realize like, hey, this is, you know, you're 40, so it's probably not anything that you've thought of, but uh, older adults do still enjoy sexual intimacy, then it's like, oh, okay, this may not be a, anything that you really want to think about, but when we're talking about a specific situation that's happening with your parent in memory care, and this is something that we need to talk to you about, and there's a specific reason why, people are pretty tuned into that but I think as as staff too we also have to be very compassionate for adult children and understand it's hard for them to hear you know it's just something that they weren't expecting and a lot of times it feels like it just came out of left field so that helps a lot is is being compassionate and uh, providing some education and giving them some time to wrap their head around you know how they want to deal with that. I can imagine the loved one, the, the adult child, thinking that their parent didn't agree to the, cons- you know, did not consent. Right. And I can see that. And uh, go- working through that would definitely could be a tough situation. And that makes me wonder also, what about like false accusations? I imagine, you know, with dementia being so much more than just memory and it's just the way we interpret the environments affected and, you, do you encounter that very often? You mean adult children? Oh, no. I, what I mean is the, um, when a resident maybe feels they were abused or does that happen where it, nothing really did? It, maybe it was hand-holding, but in their mind it went beyond that. So that's kind of a separate issue from what we're talking about. Okay. And I think the, but the first thing I'll say is, you know, it's, it's always good when everybody understands, you know, the difference between the consensual contact and, and abuse. But number two, I, I personally believe that people living with dementia are not believed often enough. Okay. There's a tendency by those around them to say, oh, they have dementia, therefore they have no credibility. Mm -hmm. When in fact, anybody can tell you, a person living with dementia will show you through their actions or their words, you know, no, I'm not eating the Brussels sprouts. I don't like it, right? I mean, they're they're aware Mm -hmm. whether they're able to say that sentence or not. They're also uh, aware about unwanted contact. I have, and and blessedly, it you know this is not um, something that I have uh, had to. Not a situation that I personally have had to manage where someone um, had unwanted sexual contact, but. I I think that it is worth listening to what people have to say. In my experience, when people um, have hallucinations or delusions, it has never, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm like going through all the, all the people and, and all of the um, situations that I've been in. It just has, I never had anybody have a hallucination or delusion related to sexual contact at all. Okay. Yeah. I think that's what I was trying to ask. I wasn't able to say it that way though. <laughs> so I, I'm sorry. It took me a minute to get there too. No, but, that's yeah. okay. I, so, so Christy, we, there's the five C's, the capacity, the consent, no interfering children, spouse or staff. Number four is coupling. Did you mm-hmm. touch on coupling? Cause I'm not sure in my mind what that meant. Yeah. So that's when people are choosing each other. Okay. Couples, yeah. couples. Okay. Right, exactly. And then care planned, you talked about, mm-hmm. which is the fifth C. Okay. Right. 
With that, is there are there any additional tips that you'd like to just share with staff or family members before we wrap up this episode? I just think, you know, it's really important to just kind of know the difference between sexual contact versus, you know, friendly touch. And so just because, you know, someone is, um, let's say, rubbing somebody's back, that doesn't mean that it is sexual in nature or, you know, they're... Um, they kiss someone on the cheek or, or give them a hug that does not indicate that it's sexual contact necessarily. Those are all friendly things. And so I think that it can be really helpful to kind of put yourself in, in that, you know, kind of step into that yourself and go, okay, you know, is this something that I would do with a friend? Okay. And, you know, I would say, almost all of the time you find out, yeah, that's true. And so again, sexual touching is not as prevalent. I don't mean to make it sound like this is something that's happening all the, <laughs> all, oh my God, <laughs> memory care. It's like, you know, Caligula's Rome. It's not. Um, but it happens enough but, that it needs yeah. to be discussed. It and does so. need to be discussed. It does. So, and, and certainly, um, you know, people can, can reach out if they'd like more information about this. Okay. Well, I want I want to thank you for discussing it with myself and the audience, Christy, because I I do think there's so many topics that we're we are surprised by, or and it's better to be informed than surprised. And so I do appreciate you talking about it. This does conclude our conversation with Christy Turner, the Dementia Sherpa, on sexual relationships in long-term care settings when an individual has dementia. Be sure to visit the show notes at togetherinthis.com forward slash episode 35 where you will find a link to Christy's website, links to any mentioned resources, subscribe buttons, and a comment section where you can share a comment or ask a question. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Alzheimer's Podcast with Mike Good of Togetherness. For more information and to get the resources mentioned in this episode, visit togetherinthis.com forward slash podcast.